Welcome to Hope Awakens. I really appreciate you joining me. And you are joining people from around the world for Hope Awakens, including Anna, who's in Petoskey, Michigan, Keresi in Fiji, Jennifer in Barbados, Nemi in the Philippines, Julia in Miami, Florida, and Donna in Buffalo, Wyoming. We've got something powerful ahead. Thanks for being part of Hope Awakens. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is Hope Awakens from the George Vanderman Studio at It Is Written, just outside Chattanooga, Tennessee. Tonight at 7 Eastern, Hope Awakens begins in Spanish, Esperanza en Jesus, presented by my good friend, Pastor Robert Costa of It Is Written's Spanish language ministry, Escrito Esta. You can find the link for it at hopeawakens.org under the video on the homepage. Hope you'll tell someone else about what's going to be a very special series of presentations. Tomorrow night at 7 Eastern, join Doug and me in our Facebook group, the It Is Written Official Community Facebook group. We'll be answering more of your Bible questions, those questions that we've not been able to get to, and praying for prayer requests. If you're not already part of the group, you can request to join the group, or you can register at hopeawakens.org to receive an invitation to the group. Remember, it is at hopeawakens.org where you will find resources. You can watch previous presentations there and you can submit questions, something you weren't expecting me to say. You can also submit video questions. There's a link where it says, Ask Pastor Bradshaw. If you'd like to send us a video question, we'd love to receive it. With your questions right now, here's the director of SALT. It is written special ministry that teaches people how to effectively share their faith in Jesus, Doug Naa, thank you for being here. Hey, John, it's good to be here with our Hope Awakens uh, viewers. And again, we have some good questions this morning. Here's the first one. Can you please explain uh, Matthew 10 and verse 28 where it says, Fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul. Now, does that mean we have a body and a soul? Well, yes and no. What it means is fear him who is able to destroy both body and breath. The word there means breath. That means that hell will destroy sin and everyone associated with absolutely completely. It's not talking about a soul that wisps off anywhere. It's the combination of, it's what a body's made of, body and breath. How do you explain dinosaurs and the age of the earth? Ah, uh, Probably not easily to be honest with you, but here's the point. What I mean by that is this. There are experts everywhere who have their ideas and those ideas often differ just a little bit. But here's what we know. The earth was created recently. We know that. We also know that dinosaurs existed and they weren't here before the earth was here. It certainly appears they were on this earth at the same time as human beings. When, where, how exactly, we don't know. Why were they destroyed? Was it that ice age? Look, let's leave that to the scientists. But here's what we know. The Bible makes clear the earth was created recently. Human beings were here. Dinosaurs were here had to have coexisted. How do you explain all the scriptures that point to God destroying so many people, and yet we are told that He's a loving God, and He doesn't have a desire to destroy anyone? Yeah, good question. Well, let me explain it this way. How would you explain the President of the United States ordering American troops to participate in World War II, or any other conflict for that matter? Does it prove that the President is unloving? No. The survival of Israel was at stake. You know, Israel was surrounded by nations that wanted Israel destroyed. God was protecting His people. If He hadn't, Israel would have been wiped out and the Messiah would not have come. That's why this happened. Now, before the Ten Commandments were given to Moses, John, was there a law that the people were aware of to govern their lives? Absolutely. The Bible says that Abraham kept God's commandments. It says that in Genesis 26. It said that when Cain killed Abel, there was sin. The Ten Commandments were in existence. Well, for as long as God has been in existence. Now, I understand that when we die, we sleep in the grave, but yet I've heard my pastor say when we die, we return back to the breath of God. And does that mean that our loved ones are watching over us? No, it doesn't. And let me assure you, you don't want your loved ones watching over you. You just don't. There are some things that's better off that they are not involved in. Uh, what, this, what happens is this. Person dies, body goes to the grave, and the breath 
goes back to God. That means that God retains your life spark or God has the power to put life back into you one day. And thank God he will do that on the resurrection day. Now, how do I stay focused during my time of uh, devotion and prayer? That's a very good question. You, 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 well, you, you, know what we'll, you know what we'll do? We'll ask our guest this morning to speak to that in just a few moments. So let's defer that question. How do I explain to someone the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? You know, the problem people have with that is that they try to explain too much or they start walking on ground they shouldn't be walking on. Look, here's what we know. We know that the Father is God. No question about that. We know that Jesus is God. And we know the Bible makes abundantly clear that the Holy Spirit is God. So you have three distinct different people. They're all different. And yet they comprise one God. If you stick with the facts, those things that you can easily see, and if you don't let anybody shake you, what happens? Is someone says, well, the Spirit, that's the Spirit of Jesus. Or it's the Spirit of God. And then if you allow yourself to get bamboozled by that, you can say, oh my, what does this mean? Here's, here's what it means. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. Those things are clear. Stick with what's clear. And if there are some things that are fuzzy to you, talk to God about it, and He will clarify it for you in the fullness of time. Now, John, how can I tell if I have faith or not? Yes, good question. But Jesus said in John chapter 7, if any man will do his will, he will know of the doctrine. If anyone will do his will. James wrote that faith without works is dead. So you have faith if you're not simply hearing principles, but if they're impacting your life and molding your life. Faith is believing in the Word of God and then expecting it to do what it says it will do. So hang on to Jesus. And by the way, don't second guess yourself. If you're watching this presentation, you at least have some faith. Bring it to Jesus and let it grow. Did Adam and Eve begin aging at creation or at the fall? Well, it all depends on what you mean by aging. They were getting older as soon as creation had taken place, but the ravages of aging didn't start bothering them until after sin. Now, how can I understand the Bible more clearly? Again, what you really want to do is take the Bible and read. Do something with what you know. Uh, maybe this is where John 7 is so clear. Understand the Bible, take what you have, follow that, and you grow, you grow, and you grow, and you grow. Read it. You can't understand it without reading it, without digging into it. So read, pray, ask God to guide your understanding, spend more time in the Bible, and then act on what you got, and God will give you more. Now, you mentioned that the comma was misplaced in Luke 23, verse 43. The question is, why did God allow this to happen, and how do we know with certainty that this mistake is not repeated again in Scripture? It's a good question. The only way around this, Doug, is for God to have taken the pen out of the hand of the translator, who, who the translators who put the tr uh, punctuation in there and said, no, no, let me put that there. Yeah. <laughs> the second reason God might have allowed that is so that we would look at that and go, huh, and then really study the Bible to find out what is so. The way you know it's not all through the Bible is by reading the Bible and checking and studying. Now, would you please repeat uh, the information about the children's study information? I would be happy to. If you'd like to know more about children's studies, go to myplacewithjesus.com. That is, it is written as children's ministry, especially take kids on the journey through the Bible. It's the Bible reading plan. And there you can find the It Is Written, My Place With Jesus Bible Guides for Kids. I really appreciate that question. I'm, I'm glad you asked. Myplacewithjesus.com. Get your kids into the Word of God. That's great. Now, you said that when people die, they sleep and await the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I know two people who saw apparitions of family members after they died. Yeah, the deceiver is the devil. Now, I, I can't tell you what they saw. Maybe they had low blood sugar or maybe, I don't know, they're having an episode. But those apparitions do not indicate that our loved ones live on. And you can know that the devil is the one that sows deception. I'm not trying to tell you your family members were mixed up with the devil. I don't mean that. But deception comes from the devil. What we do know is that it wasn't the family members. They mm. were not back from the dead. Now, what does it mean in, when the Bible says one shall be taken and the other shall be left? Well, what that means is that one will be saved and one will be lost. It's that simple. Matthew chapter 24, some will be saved. Some will be lost. Is there going to be a time when the Bible will be taken from us? 
The Bible does not say that that will happen. It could. I don't lose any sleep worrying about that because if you hide God's Word in your heart, it's not going to matter a whole lot. Now, why is it in the Bible that God is referred to as a lion in the tribe of Judah? Satan is referred to as a lion and you have this idol-worshipping city, town, that's also referred to as a lion. Good question. Good question. Maybe part of that is that Satan would like to assume the attributes that belong only to Jesus. However, what we know is this. What's a lion like? Don't climb the fence and get into the cage. It, it won't be a good thing. But what was a lion like before sin? Ah, strong, powerful, grace, graceful. That's Jesus. The lion after sin, that's like the devil. Now, someone I care for says that heaven and hell do not exist. How do I prove to this person that God is real and that Jesus is about to return? Well, you don't. You don't prove anything to anyone. But what you do is you model and you pray and you share. You might be able to share something gentle from the Bible to give that person something to think about. You might be able to share a good book. You might be able to share a Hope Awakens presentation. Share gently and model and pray. Now, John, many people are talking about the end of the world. Now, do you, do you think we are nearing the end of the world? And what about this thing called the latter rain? Well, I say this to people frequently, and that is that my opinion is really of little consequence. But everything indicates that we're getting near to the end of the world, sure. The question is how near is near? We'll find out in the fullness of time. The latter rain, that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God, that will come before the end of the world. So it seems like we're getting very close to that time. Thank you for your questions. Doug, I think that's all we have time for. Very good. Very good. Appreciate it very much. And remember that Doug and I will be together tomorrow night at seven. Uh, the uh, It Is Written official Facebook community group, and we'll be answering questions there. Tell you more about that tonight. I've got a special guest this morning, Pavel Goya, a pastor, author, editor, international speaker. He loves to talk about prayer. We had him last night. So much to talk about. I've asked Pastor Goya to come back this morning. Pastor Pavel Goya, thank you for joining me. My privilege. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Hey, I got a question and it came just a moment ago. You might have heard this. What are some of the things that, that people find hard about praying? How can they stay focused and eliminate distractions? So... Um, some of the things that they find difficult, that keep asking questions, uh, how to improve in prayer, uh, one of them would be focusing. How can we stay focused? Because our mind has a tendency to wander in a thousand directions. Well, uh, let me explain just two, three points quick. Number one, when we pray routine prayer, kind of the same words every day, like meal prayer, sleep prayer, uh, after a while the brain doesn't need to focus because the words just come like poetry. Prayer should not be routine. Prayer should be the opening of the heart to God, should be an honest conversation. I cannot imagine me and my wife talking the same 10 words, like 20 words or whatever routine talk every day. I think I'll sleep on the couch. Basically, you need, when you go to God, you need to have a conversation. That's an, an, a way to focus. And second way, you need to realize you go into God's presence, angels covered. It's the God of the universe, the most holy one. Yeah, as you process that, it helps. But another short point is discipline. Basically, if the mind would wander, bring it back. And the more you do that, the more you get used. And last point that is important, people look for emotions, feelings, feelings that God is listening. God doesn't depend on our emotions. Our emotions are related to chemistry. God's love is related to his character, uh, his covenant. You don't need to feel that God is listening. He is listening. He can hear you. He knows your thoughts. That's a beautiful thought. Now, I have another question. It's another very important question. What do you do about prayers that are not answered? This perplexes a mm. lot of people. Mm. That's a good question. Absolutely profound question. Um, to every honest prayer, an answer will come. But the problem is that we expect God to answer right away. God answers in his time, in his way, sometimes differently than the way we expect. Think about the, the prayer in the prayers in the Bible. Uh, most of them, the answer was a process, not an event. It took time. It took 25 years for Abraham to receive an answer. It took uh, uh, several years for uh, Joseph to receive, for Daniel, for Noah to receive an answer, for uh, um, uh, 
Anyway, so many, I could give so many examples. When Samuel was born, you know, it, it takes several years. Anna, she prayed for several years until she got a baby. We pray, we say, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. Uh, those who wait upon the Lord receive strength. Uh, in, uh, basically, when you pray, you need to trust that God in his wisdom, who knows the whole picture, he would answer better than you pray. And in the way that if you knew the end from the beginning, you choose the same. But there is another point. We pray so much for temporary things. Jesus didn't come to die for temporary life. He came to give us eternal life. And so that's the reason sometimes God answers differently because this life goes fast and we lose everything if we don't lose eternal life. And God answers in a way that would prepare us for eternity. And when we will be in heaven, we are going to be very thankful for that. And even now, two, three years later, we look back and we say, he answered the best way. So sometimes they seem not to be answered. But God answers in his love just better than we ask. You did this last night when we spoke. I want to ask you to do it again. Talk to me about, about examples of, of answered prayer. I'm going to give you an example of an answered, answered prayer. That one that is seen not to be answered, but in the end it was answered. Uh, quick example. We used to live in uh, Kentucky. And uh, our oldest son and his wife and our granddaughter lived in uh, Wisconsin. It was about roughly eight hour drive between us. And sure, we miss our kids. We want to be close to our kids like everybody, you know, and we want to be close to our granddaughter, obviously, you know, she's so sweet. I mean, uh, grandchildren are something else, you know, and, and so we talked to them and we said, when you finish school, when you go for your master's, don't go in Wisconsin or somewhere at the end of the world. Come here in Kentucky. There are schools here. You can live close to us. We can help you taking care of the baby. We can... And they said, oh, we'll consider that. We prayed, they prayed, and we prayed that the Lord would move them in Lexington close to us. Well, she was in some type of nuclear physics bachelor, and then she wanted to apply for a master's for nuclear physics. And she applied in Lexington, as we asked, and uh, they rejected. They said, you apply too late. Uh, registration was in February, and you applied in May uh, next year. Wait another year. And then she said, shouldn't we pray about it? I said, yes, we should pray. And I pray, Lord. I didn't pray, Lord, may your will be done. I said, Lord, move them here. I prayed my will. I said, but please, please work. Well, uh, we prayed for a whole week and, and, and she fasted one day and my wife fasted one day. And after a week of prayer, we finished prayer. Sunday, a week of prayer. And Monday, she got a letter in the mail from UPenn, University of Pennsylvania. It's an Ivy League school. A letter that she's invited to their nuclear physics program in Pennsylvania. And that's an amazing school in Pennsylvania, but that would be not eight hours, that would be 12 hours from us. So God, instead of bringing them close to us, put them farther away. I was so upset. I said, Lord, I am asking you to bring them in Lexington and you put them so far that I cannot even visit with them. Well, we, uh, she said, listen, we prayed about it. Trust in the Lord. You, you taught me to do that. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Three months later, I got a call and we moved to Maryland two hours from them. Imagine if they moved in Lexington and we would have moved in Maryland. But God knows the end from the beginning. Yes, he does. We're encouraged by that. Trust, pray, expect God to work. Uh, Pastor Pavel Goya, thank you very much for joining us on Hope Awakens. I really appreciate it. My privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Pavel Goya, author, editor, pastor, and international speaker. Uh, just very blessed to have him here today. Let's pray and then dive into our Bible subject together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to have you here to speak to our hearts. Guide us in our thoughts. Bless us from your word. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 213 words later, that short speech concluded with these words. This nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. The Gettysburg Address was delivered four and a half months after the Battle of Gettysburg in which the armies of the Union defeated those of the Confederacy. What's often forgotten is that President Abraham Lincoln wasn't the only speaker that day. He wasn't even the main speaker. That honor was bestowed on Edward Everett, a former U.S. Secretary of State, 
former senator and governor from the state of Massachusetts. Everett was considered to be the finest orator of the day. He spoke for more than two hours. Today, not a soul remembers what he said. President Lincoln spoke that day, November 19th, 1863, for just two minutes. Yet what was said in just 10 sentences is now one of the best known speeches in American history. Some years before he gave the Gettysburg Address, citizen Abraham Lincoln delivered a speech in Springfield, Illinois, upon accepting the Republican Party's nomination for senator. He was not successful in his run for the Senate. He lost to a Democrat named Stephen A. Douglas. But the speech he gave on that day began with these words. A house divided against itself cannot stand. He was talking about the United States. He stated his belief that the United States couldn't be half slave states and half free states. He said he didn't believe the country would fall, but that it would ultimately go one way or the other. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Lincoln was quoting Jesus, who had said in Matthew 12, 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. By the time Lincoln appeared on the scene, the United States had grown substantially since its very humble beginnings. The population of the country when Lincoln spoke that day in Springfield, right around 30 million. It was a long way from the year 1620, in which a little over 100 passengers boarded the Mayflower and sailed from Plymouth on England's south coast. Around 30 crew were on that boat with the 100 passengers. After a couple of false starts, owing to its companionship leaking, the Mayflower arrived on the other side of the ocean. It was November when Cape Cod was first sighted. So they managed to arrive at a time of year when the weather was going to be inhospitable. By the time the winter was over, just over half the passengers and crew were still alive. Disease had taken the rest. Of the passengers, just over a third were Puritan separatists who had come to this new land in order to break away from the established Church of England. They were looking to create a society in harmony with their religious ideals. Some of them were destined for the colony of Virginia. Four of them were children who were indentured servants. It was a rough start for the colonists. But within 150 years, a lot changed. There was war between the 13 colonies and England. And in 1776, the Declaration of Independence was written. In 1776, with a population approaching just 3 million, the United States was formed and independence from Britain was declared. Drafted by Thomas Jefferson and approved unanimously by the Continental Congress on July the 4th, 1776, the declaration begins. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and then follow some of the most famous words written in the modern history of the world. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The United States had declared themselves to be free, and freedom is valued. Most societies value freedom, freedom of the press, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. But wouldn't you expect that something as valuable as freedom would come under attack? And it has in so many ways. And that's because there's someone who hates freedom. We're caught in a battle, every one of us. What do we see? We see war, we see racism, we see terrorism, we see violence, we see illness. If you wanted to, you could simply say, things are rough. You could say, people can be lousy, accidents happen. You could say, people get sick. And that'd be fair enough. But somewhere along the line, you'd have to ask yourself why these things are so. Does it make any sense at all that one nation would wipe out or oppress another? Do random acts of senseless violence make any sense at all? The idea that people are bad, why would people be bad? If you have a rash on your skin, the first question you ask is, where'd that come from? You know there's a cause behind it. You have a pain in your back. You know you've done something to aggravate your back. Cancer. 
something has gone wrong. It's not always due to smoking or drinking or poor diet. Cancer can just come from out of nowhere, hit you by surprise. But even if we don't know the reason, reason, what we know is that cells have begun to divide without stopping and they've spread into the surrounding tissue. You know what I'm saying. Symptoms are evidence. Well, let me say that again. Symptoms of anything are evidence of something. And so we look at the world today and we say that we are seeing symptoms. That's what you see with anger and hate and violence and illness and all of that. These are symptoms. So what's the cause? There's one story in the Bible that really shows this clearly, the story of Job. And as we read that story, we're able to see what Job could not see. Job learns that his oxen and his donkeys were all taken by bandits and that his servants were killed. Next, he hears his sheep are gone. More of his servants are killed. Then his camels and more servants. Then his sons and daughters killed in a freak storm. You'd think that'd be too much for Job. But the Bible says in Job 1.21 that he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The next verse says, In all this Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. What was going on in the background is that the devil had told God that Job was only faithful because God had blessed Job so much. Next thing we see, Job is afflicted with a terrible disease and it was all brought on by Satan. God is wanting us to see that we are in a spiritual battle, that it's very real. There's an enemy and Satan's goal in all he did then and in what he's doing now was to lead Job and us to curse you to your face, as Satan said to God. Look, you're having a bad day. You've got to know the world isn't against you. Your family isn't against you. Luck isn't against you. There's someone very real who's doing all he can to choke the joy out of your life, to convince you that things are dark when they're not, hopeless when you have hope. There's someone who wants you to think that you're a failure, a spiritual failure, worthless, or worth less because he's dragging this world off course. And on the other hand, we can't ever forget that someone chose to die so that we could rejoice in the promise of everlasting life. Jesus, the divine son of God, lived on this earth and then died on a cross so we could say, he succeeded for me. He suffered for me. He purchased my pardon. He bore my guilt. He took my shame. Jesus did all of that for you. That's what the cross is about. That was the place of heaven's greatest victory because there sin was defeated. There pardon was offered. There healing streams of grace were presented to the world, presented to you. So you could face every day knowing that whatever your lot in life, you have the assurance that God is with you, that angels minister to you. Jesus is your friend and that you now have an eternal future. You'd expect freedom to be attacked and we see that one day it will be. Ultimately, the house of this world is going to be divided over an issue, a significant issue. We'll find out about that right now. And I want to suggest something to you. Remember this verse, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. You should expect the unexpected. A good deception looks good. That's why counterfeiters don't make counterfeit $3 bills or seven pound notes or 12 peso coins. Our cat caught a bird a couple of days ago. You can be sure the cat didn't give the bird any reason to think there was trouble brewing. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. The United States, since its establishment, has been very open about its Judeo-Christian values. Even the currency of the nation bears the words, in God we trust. If you were the devil, and if you were planning to deprive people of freedom, and there was a nation that was a bright and shining light for freedom, Wouldn't you go after that nation? No doubt you would. As you look at the Bible, you find that the prophecies of the Bible discuss the United States. 
and reveal that this nation will occupy an influential role down here in the close of time. Let's look at the book of Revelation, starting in Revelation 13 and verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, we looked last time at the identity of this beast. Now, remember, when we say beast, we're meaning a nation because that's a prophetic symbol. A beast in prophecy represents a nation. And so then there's another beast in Revelation 13, meaning another nation. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. The four nations we see in Daniel 2 and then in Daniel 7, those are Babylon and then Medo-Persia and then Greece and then Rome. So, So how do we understand this one? Let's look at it again carefully. Revelation 13, 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Now, notice that it comes up out of the earth. If you look at the prophetic symbols in the Bible, you'll see that the sea is a symbol, and it represents in prophecy multitudes of people. It says that in Revelation chapter 17. Compare verse 1 with verse 15. It's very clear. So if the sea represents multitudes of people, a sparsely populated area would represent comparatively few people. Now, when does it arise? It had to have come up recently. It emerges after the four kingdoms and after the divided kingdoms and after the arrival of the little horn power. This is a new nation being depicted in the Bible. And how does it come up? Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke as a dragon. Notice it says, two horns like a lamb. In the New Testament, a lamb always represents Jesus. Or let me say that again. In the book of Revelation, a lamb always represents Jesus, except for here. This is the one exception. This is a lamb-like nation. We would have to conclude that in some way it is Christ-like. And notice there are no crowns on this nation. A crown would show that there's monarchy, a kingly authority, but there's no crowns here. What we're seeing here is something that stands for freedom. So here's what we know. It arises in a sparsely populated area. It is a young nation. There is no monarchy. It would assume a position of worldwide power and influence. The only nation in the world that fits that description is the United States of America. When it arose, it was known as the New World. It was a haven for people escaping religious persecution, and it was founded on the freedom of religion and government. But according to what we read in the Bible, There will come a time when a change comes over the heart of this nation. Well, how do we know that? The Bible says it will speak as a dragon. And notice what verse 12 says. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. According to what we read in the Bible, the second nation mentioned in Revelation 13 is going to use its power and influence to cause the world to follow the first nation. The first nation represented or mentioned in Revelation 13. We looked at that last time. 
The Protestant reformers looked at what was going on in their day and they said, the church dominating the world fits every specification of the power that's going to use its influence in earth's last days in a very negative way. They looked at the Bible and they saw what we see today. Look at how Daniel described it. This is all in Daniel 7. He described this little horn as being small, as arising in Western Europe, as rising after 476 AD. Remember, you had Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, then Rome divided into 10 nations. Then the little horn came up out of those 10 nations. That's the prophetic flow we see in the Bible. Daniel said it would destroy three of the nations. He said there'd be somebody at its head. It would speak blasphemy against God. It would persecute God's people. It would think to change times and laws. And it would reign for 1260 years, which it did, ascending to power in 538 AD, suffering a deadly wound in 1798 when its leader was captured by Napoleon's forces and taken into exile. That was Pope Pius. So what we're seeing in the Bible is that the second nation would cause the world to worship that first nation, which leads us to that big issue in earth's last days. Starting in verse 16 of Revelation 13, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So what's the mark of the beast? What is the mark of that first nation represented in Revelation chapter 13? Or what is the sign of the authority of the church of Rome? We've looked at this. Read with me. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Here's the answer given. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. That's very clear. Fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday. Yet there's no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath or day of rest was, of course, Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. One more. Reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these two alternatives, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. That was written by Cardinal Gibbons. Think about this. A church changed the Ten Commandments. A church changed the law of God. Now, if you think it's okay for a church to change the law of God, then you won't have a problem with this. But imagine if every church changed the commandments and every denomination had something a little different. One would be okay with dishonoring your parents. One might be okay with adultery. Another is fine with bowing down to idols, which is another story, actually. If you look at the Ten Commandments in the Roman Catholic teaching, you will see that the commandment about worshiping idols is either missing or is merged with the first commandment. That's because there was, and there still is, so much in the way of idols and images in that church. But removing a commandment would leave you one short. So the 10th commandment, the one about coveting, was cut in two and became both the ninth and the 10th commandments. One more quote. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. Well, the century's wrong, but we'll leave that as it is. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the scripture, but from the church's sense of its own power. That's from a church in Michigan. Of course, that's not an official statement from the magisterium, from the Vatican itself, but it's the view of one priest and it agrees with history. So now we understand how this can be fulfilled. The Bible says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. The mark of the beast is very simple. When you accept the change to God's holy moral law, following what the beast says instead of what God says, you accept the mark of the beast's authority in your life. Ultimately, the mark of the beast is rejecting the sovereignty of God. The true Sabbath is humanity coming into communion with God according to God's will. And that's the seal of God. The seal of God's law is the seventh-day Sabbath. The mark of the beast 
is a counterfeit, where people choose their own way and put that ahead of the word and the will of a loving God. Well, how can it be wrong when everyone's doing it? We both know that a counterfeit is always very close to the true. And just because the majority is doing something, sure doesn't make it right. Might seem like a small thing, but it's not small to God. It's a matter of the heart. When God has your heart, you'll want to do His will as you come to understand it. And remember what Jesus said. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So what does it mean to receive the mark of the beast in the forehead or hand? Having it in your forehead means you have it in your mind. You choose it. You agree with it. You've given your mind, your assent to this. Receiving it in your hand means that even if you don't agree with it, you are going along with it. Now, some people enthusiastically say that the mark of the beast has something to do with buying and selling. So it's going to be a silicon chip or it's going to be a card or some such thing. This is where I'd like you to think about what the world is going through right now. We honestly don't know what the mechanism will be that will govern buying and selling. No doubt if there's computers involved, it makes it very simple. But there are already computers and chips involved at your bank, in your credit card, in your phone. No, the mark of the beast is that change in God's law that rejects one of God's commandments and replaces it with a substitute day, Sunday. How can that stop people from buying and selling? Well, let's try to separate a couple of things here. One is the mark of the beast. The other is how the mark will be enforced. Whatever the mark of the beast is, there will be some people who don't want to go along with it. So in order to force people to accept it, it will be said that if you don't take the mark of the beast, you won't be able to buy and sell. What will the mechanism be that prevents people from buying and selling? Again, we don't know. But we live in a society now that is edging closer and closer to being able to control people's spending or their buying and selling. Your paycheck, you don't, you don't see cash anymore. It's either direct deposited or you have to bank a check. But that's old hat. Now people pay with their smartphones. You think this is a process that could be manipulated? Sure. How do most people get cash these days? With a card out of a machine. Do you think it'd be hard to control a process like that? Nope. A huge amount of trading is done with cards, credit or debit. Have you ever been told, sorry, but your card is denied? What can you do then? You sure can't buy or sell. Now, I am not saying that these are the methods that will necessarily be used to prevent people from buying and selling. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I am telling you for certain that the card, the chip, the computer is not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is that change made by human beings to the law of God. But what we see right now is that we are already living in a time when buying and selling can be controlled. Any new developments may just make it easier to do what is largely already being done. Hear me carefully. Whatever the mechanism is used to prevent people from buying and selling, that's not the mark of the beast. It's just a way to enforce the beast, uh, the mark of the beast. A person's behavior can be influenced when they can't pay their rent or buy their food. It's an old practice, nothing new about it. Sanctions and boycotts have been around for a long time. South Africa, Iraq, Cuba, other countries. Many people among us have lived in a time when money wasn't the answer to one's needs. During wartime, there was rationing. People simply couldn't buy and sell like they were used to. Think with me. For weeks now, people haven't been able to buy and sell as they have been accustomed in many parts of the world. It has all been upset. People have been restricted from moving by law. People have been confined, told they can't go anywhere. And this is is a time of peace. Think with me now. Of course, the pandemic is very serious. It demonstrates to us that things can change just like that. Shops closed, businesses closed, cannot work, cannot go out. Pause with me here. In some countries around the world, the police established hotlines so that if you saw somebody breaking the coronavirus restrictions, you were to call them and report them to the authorities. I have a friend, listen to this. His neighbor left food outside 
so that the neighbor's unemployed son with two small children could come and get the food and take it home. The neighbor across the street screamed, what are you doing? Get out of here. Got into almost a fight with the... This is how people were acting over an illness. I'm not saying it's small. It's pretty big. Let me remind you of something. You have seen it play out over the last few weeks. When it's a time of crisis, society reacts. And there is coming a major crisis. Daniel speaks of a time of trouble coming such as never was since there was a nation. In a time of crisis, you can imagine people saying, we've got to come together. In a time of crisis, you can imagine people wanting to take time out, to let the environment rest, to give people a break. Good things. But when worship is regulated, mandated, enforced, when consciences are forced and your freedom is taken away and you are compelled to violate God's law, we've already seen churches closed. Now, for good reasons. I'm not against that. For good reasons. A friend told me his church had police stopping by, making sure there weren't too many people there. They were recording the worship service. They were ready to close it down and kick people out. Looking into the future, we can see that this will happen again, but on steroids. People will promote the mark of the beast as a good thing, as a help, as a rest, as a timeout. But when you have the law of God relegated and the law of a church promoted, the law of man above the law of God, that's where the disciple of Jesus has to say, that's too much, that's too much. Does anybody have the mark of the beast today? No, nobody. But we see in Revelation 13, the day is coming when this will be enforced. We can imagine it now. What we've seen over the last couple of months has primed us. We can see this happening now, no question. Then it will be the mark of the beast. Today, even though this thing is counter to the will of God, it has not yet become the mark of the beast. Can we envisage a time when society will be regulated? Yes, we can. Can we envisage a time when people will be prevented from buying and selling? When your movements will be restricted? When tracking devices will be placed on your phone? When people will volunteer to be tracked? when neighbors will call the authorities to report on neighbors violating restrictions. Ladies and gentlemen, society has already demonstrated we are ready. So it becomes important to make decisions that will see you stand faithfully for Jesus and His Word. If you value the cross of Christ today, you'll value it then. If you've come to know Jesus as a friend today, you'll have Him as a friend then. If you're serious about the Word of God now, You'll be serious about it then. If your eyes are on Jesus today, they'll be on Jesus tomorrow. Jesus said that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Go back to the time of Cain and Abel. God told them what offerings to bring or how to worship. Abel followed God's instructions. Cain thought wasn't so important. He thought that as long as he brought God something, an offering, and worshiped God, details didn't matter. So he brought an offering of his own works, produce from the field. He was angry when God accepted Abel's offering, but rejected his own. God tried to get Cain to obey, but he persisted in rebellion. And by the time he came to his senses, the body of his brother lay dead on the ground. Cain was cursed as a result, and God put a mark on him lest future generations should take revenge. In the closing moments of earth's history, God asks us to worship Him. He asks us to worship Him specifically, tells us how. And all will be identified either by the seal of God, the seal of the law of God, or the mark of the beast. No, this has nothing to do with a laser beam or a chip in your hand. God's issues are more than skin deep. They go all the way to the heart. The question is, who will you worship? Who do you love? Do you value heaven above earth? The truth is we've seen this before in the Bible. In the book of Daniel, the king passed a law that everyone must come out to the plain of Dura and worship an image, false worship enforced by law. God showed us this in the past. In Daniel 2, the image Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream was made from gold, silver, bronze or brass and iron. Then the feet were made out of iron and clay. 
knowing that the head of gold represented Babylon and knowing Daniel's interpretation made it clear Babylon would one day pass off the world stage, Nebuchadnezzar had an image constructed that was made entirely of gold. He was saying, my kingdom will never pass away. He commanded everyone to come together and worship the image. But when they bowed down, three men stayed standing. They were Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, Daniel's three friends. Daniel was evidently out of town that day. There's no mention of him in the story. Maybe the king knew he would never bow down. So he got Daniel out the way. But there they were gathered together to participate in an act of mandated worship, worship enforced by law. Why do you think the story is in the book of Daniel? God is using it to show us what's gonna happen in the future. The music starts, it's the law, they have to worship. But here's what we read. Some people come running to report to the king. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Now notice the reaction of the king. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, both, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Now, there was a question. And what would their answer be? You know, the Bible says that the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He does a lot of roaring, but here's what you need to remember. First John 4 verse 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's your answer in temptation. God is greater. That's your answer in trial. God is greater. That's your answer when you're in need. God is greater. A vast army of unnumbered millions might come against you, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God is greater. Jesus died for you on an old rugged cross. And these three young men believed that. Look at what they said. Daniel 3, starting in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Don't you love that? Our God is able, he'll deliver us. But if not, even if he doesn't, we are still not gonna bow down to your image, O king. Who wouldn't bow down to an image to save their lives? Wouldn't they be better off alive than dead? Why make such a big deal over something so small? Ah, but this wasn't small. This was faithfulness to God. Jesus has been so faithful to us. Why wouldn't we be faithful to him? God has loved us so much. We don't wanna sell our faith now. Jesus is coming back soon. Why don't you make a decision now for Jesus? Don't worry about your lack of faith, your lack of strength. Take hold of the hand of God and the grace of God will flow through your life. Take hold of the hand of God and you will receive the righteousness of Christ. Jesus is your hope. Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus hides you under the shadow of of his wings. We look into the future today and we see that there will be a world divided. You can stand on the side of Jesus by taking hold of Jesus by faith, yielding your heart to him, trusting in him and believing that he will do what he says he will do in your life. I wanna give you the opportunity to make a decision right now. Here's what I want you to do. Take out your phone. This is not gonna work on Facebook. Don't type this into Facebook, don't do that. But take your phone, 
or whatever device you text on, I'm assuming it's a phone, and you're gonna send me a text message. You're gonna, you're gonna text this number. Let's do it together. I wanna do this with you. The number is 423-264-2575. Do I have the number right? 423-264, well, I put a three, so I'm gonna go back, 2575. Here's the number, you see it on the screen. 423-264-2575. If you're listening on the radio, I'll say it again for you. 423-264-2575. Now, the message you're gonna send me is SEAL. And as you send that message to me, I'll text you right back. And I should be texting myself back. And there's a link. And it says, please fill out the card at, and there's a little short link. Okay, text me. Use your phone, not Facebook. Use your phone, 423-264-2575 and send me the word SEAL and I'll send you a link. And you click on that link and I'll send you this. Let's look at this. You're gonna get some questions here. Fill out the card for me. It's an opportunity for you to make a decision for Jesus. I can't hand it out to you in your seat. So if you text that number and send the word SEAL, S-E-A-L, you get a link back. Click the link. It's safe. No problem. No, no, no problem. Number one, I choose to follow the teachings of Jesus as found in the Bible. What do you think we should do with that? I'm going to click yes. Yes. That's point number one. Number two is right below it. I choose not to worship the beast or receive the mark of the beast. I'm clicking yes. Yes, I choose that. All right. If you're picking up your phone now, you're wondering what the number is. It's right there on the screen. 423-264-2575 and send the word SEAL. You get a link back. I want you to make a decision for Jesus today. I sincerely hope you will. The third point, I choose to worship Him that made heaven and earth by keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Yes, we are simply saying, I want to be faithful to God and follow His leading in my life. That's what we're saying. I want to be faithful to Jesus. I want to keep the seventh day Sabbath. I want Jesus to do his will in my life. You have questions? Uh, say yes and know that Jesus will answer those questions. You're not sure how it's going to work out? He is sure. It is my desire to be baptized or rebaptized. If the answer is yes, even if you're wondering about that, say yes, Lord, I'm willing to follow your leading. If you don't need to be baptized or rebaptized, just click no. If there's other, you got a question, other. I have questions I would like to discuss. You can fill out your questions right there. How may we pray for you? Let us know. And then fill out your email and your zip code. And you have a couple of options there. 423-264-2575. Send us the, the word SEAL. We'll send you a link. And today, right now, you can make a decision for Jesus. Let me pray for your decision. Our Father in heaven, we want Jesus' will to be done in our lives. Guide every decision for your glory. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking forward to seeing you tonight. Don't miss it tonight. Great presentation. See you for more on Hope Awakened.